Uh, my name is Greg Fredman. I work as an agricultural engineer with the ISU Extension Service. Most of the time I work in southeast Iowa. My office is in Iowa City, uh, the Johnson County Extension Office, and I work as an ag engineer for ISU in the southeast part of the state. Uh, kind of before we start out, I'm a little bit curious if I can find somebody else that's maybe better qualified than me to come up here and teach this, right? Anybody here have a solar installation that, at this point? Okay, well, we may be calling on several of you for thoughts, ideas, and information. I certainly don't claim to be the solar expert, but I, I do have uh, some background in that and uh, some experience. And so, but as we go along, if there are things that, that divergence of opinions or things you would like to throw in, that's just fine as well. Uh, Maybe I should ask how many are seriously considering uh, putting in some type of solar uh, TV. Okay, the number of hands, quite a few hands going up. And uh, I won't, won't quiz you real hard on whether you've got bids and things like that already, but uh, certainly that helps me in kind of having a, a look at uh, kind of what sort of information you may be looking for as we go through this. And as we go along throughout the afternoon, uh, uh, certainly I know they say save the questions to the end, but if you do have a burning question, uh, raise your hand and we'll try and get that, uh, get that incorporated in. Now you go, wait a second, I thought this talk was about solar. Can you show wind speed in Iowa? Uh, what's going on? Well, we're going to talk about solar, but I thought before we did that, if you're interested in solar, you're probably interested in a variety of alternative energy uh, generation types of systems. And as we look at probably the two that I think of are either wind power or solar power, and I want to just give you a little perspective on the wind side of things. And this is looking at the state of Iowa, and I know I don't have Illinois and Wisconsin, but as you go further east, folks aren't quite as windy as they are to the west of us. And so, uh, you know, probably what I'll say for northeast Iowa will be fairly close to what it might be for, for uh, Wisconsin and Illinois. And this just looks at wind speeds across the state. It's probably in units uh, maybe a little difficult to see, but shows anywhere from uh, less than 12 mile an hour average wind speed at 50 meters above the ground to up to uh, 19, well, 18, 19 miles per, miles per hour out here in northwest Iowa. You say, yeah, 12 to 19, that's kind of a big difference. Actually, it's a lot bigger than what you might realize. If you look at the power that we get from wind, it's actually a form of solar energy because wind blows because of uneven heating of the Earth's surface. So really all our energy does come from the sun. And certainly it varies widely worldwide. But the power that we get is proportional to the wind speed cube. Not just directly proportional, it's not even proportional to the square of the wind speed, it's proportional to the wind speed cube. So trust me. Okay. I'll let, the, I'll let the technology folks take care of that. So hopefully we're now getting this recorded and uh, be, a, be a bit. So if you increase the wind speed, let's just say 10%. That's a, if it's squared, that's 1.1 and 1.1, that's 20%. But if you take that and 1.1 again, that's just a 10% increase in wind speed, almost a 30% increase in power. In fact, if you go from just 8 mile an hour to 10 mile an hour, it nearly doubles the power output from the wind turbine. So wind speed is a really big deal, uh, and just even localized areas of changing wind speed are very important. I just went and looked from northwest Iowa with the average wind speed at 50 meters, 70 miles an hour, 
down to the southeast part of the state where I work, at 14 miles an hour. That's the difference of about 20%. That means the Scandinavian turbine in northwest Iowa would get almost 70% more power from that than what I would in the southeast part. Very huge difference in terms of what we're getting. And if we go back and look to uh, northeast Iowa, we see that it's even lower wind speeds than we have down here. And so uh, as, as I look at that, I go, well, there's a reason that wind turbines first went in northwest Iowa. It's also a reason that they put wind turbines on bridges. We get just a little increase of wind speed coming over that bridge. All adds up and is all very important. As we look at the solar resource across, again, this is looking across Iowa into northern, northeast, northwest Illinois, southeast Wisconsin. There's some variation uh, down here in southwest Iowa. Uh, this is in watts per square meter. Don't worry about the units, but uh, maybe approaching 165, 170. Northeast Iowa, maybe down to 160. And the power we get from that is directly proportional. So, yeah, maybe we're 5% less. Here, 10% less and down there, but that's all we use in terms of the essentially the available energy that we can get from that resource. And to me, that's one of the reasons I think we're seeing uh, a lot more interest in solar, where we had a lot more interest in wind maybe 10 or 20 years ago, that we're seeing it's, it's a more uniform uh, resource that we have to take advantage of. Now, even with that said, different areas can have different amounts of cloud cover, those sorts of things, and in you know, localized areas, we can sometimes see some differences there. We look at, I just did a comparison around, uh, essentially I'd say the four corners of Iowa. I just took some representative towns in each of those. Sibley, Iowa is a very far northwest corner of the state. One of my fellow ag engineers grew up there. Uh, if you look at putting in a 20 kilowatt wind turbine, or we look at putting in an array of solar that's rated at 20 kilowatt, in northwest Iowa, simply they might expect up to 40,000 kilowatt hours of electrical production from that 20 kilowatt unit. If we get over here in northeast Iowa, West Union, a friend of mine lives close to West Union, uh, former extension staff, down to 26,000. Big difference there. Swisher, where I live, maybe around 28,000 kilowatt hours. Southwest Iowa, 30,000. So you can see a fair amount of variation where the same solar installation, maybe not as much quite total power for that rated unit, but fairly uniform across the state. And probably at a lower installation cost for that solar uh, solar cell. As we look at probably another part of the increasing interest in solar is the decrease in price that we've seen occurring over the last uh, 10 to 15 years in terms of uh, Solar, solar cells themselves, those have come down quite a bit in cost. There's been some decrease in cost of uh, just the installation equipment, things like that as well. But if we go back to the late 2000s, it was nearly it's over $10 per watt or $10,000 per kilowatt of installed TV uh, uh, potential. That has steadily come down uh, to the point where we're now down. This shows between three and four dollars uh, a couple of years ago. We're now down probably under three dollars per watt or three thousand dollars per kW of uh, solar uh, solar capacity. And these prices uh, have continued to fall. Okay, well, how much more are they going to come down? 
I'm not sure that they're going to come down a lot more because we've gotten to the point, this is looking at the uh, relative cost of a full solar PV installation, and it's broken down between the modules themselves, that's shown in yellow, the inverter shows in blue, other hardware, the structure, the mountings on, it's shown in light blue, and then the top parts, labor, and uh, sales, overhead, profit, it's shown in the cash flow. Those prices have steadily come down for the installed uh, unit, but gotten to the point where we're actually the solar modules are a fairly small percentage of that, that total solar installation. So even if we drove those prices to zero, we're not going to drive the cost of the installed unit. The installation procedure. So, uh, this is showing that here we're down probably somewhere in those $3 per watt or $3,000 per cable of installation. And kind of on the flip side of that, whether it's looking at essentially the soft costs, whether it's the utility, commercial, or residential, the percentage has actually gone up simply because the rest of the costs the equipment have come down in relationship to that. And so we're now at the point where it's really the soft costs that are probably over half, maybe even two thirds of the cost. You say, why is the utility scale so much lower? Well, economies of scale. And you're putting up, you know, 100 kW or 500 kW as opposed to 5 kW that I've been doing. Uh, big difference. So, as we look at uh, some, some solar uh, photovoltaic installation, just some of the different things that we maybe have to consider and look at, some of the parts of that include the arrays or the cells themselves, and those cells are put into modules that are then put into arrays, and then those arrays are put together to make the whole solar installation. We usually have kind of a, two different ways of Mounting those, you see a lot of roof mounted solar arrays, partly because that's an area that you can usually find maybe facing the direction we want at somewhat of an angle, and uh, maybe actually cheaper, depending on the roofing that we have, maybe a little cheaper to mount them up there. But uh, we also have certainly a lot of ground mounted arrays. Most of what I see are fixed arrays. Our unit that will actually track the sun. We'll talk a bit more about that. We'll track it both uh, along the axis and then the azimuth as well. We do need a power inverter, at least in most situations, because most of what we use is AC power. What the solar cells put out is DC power, and I'm not going to go into how, I'll call it the magic of silicone crystals and how we get the power. I'm just having to say, yeah, we can put the sun out a little bit the But then we also need switches, wiring, and typically we need some way to store that energy. Usually if I, if I say store energy, store electricity, first thing you think about what matters is how we store electricity. But most installations that I see are connected to the grid and are interchanging power with the grid. Excess power is being produced, put it back on the electrical grid, more power is being needed, it's being put back off. How that, how you work with your utility company, or how your utility company is willing to work with you can have a huge influence on uh, the, the payback and the profitability of the company. A few definitions, I mentioned kind of Tilt angle and azimuth. What we're talking about with the solar collector in terms of tilt angle is how far off you are of horizontal. If I say a 30 degree tilt angle, that means it's up 30 degrees from horizontal and essentially 60 degrees from vertical. You say, well, what's the right tilt angle to have? Well, it changes every day, right? Every day of the year, the sun's moving to a little bit different position in the sky. And during the summertime, you like a fairly flat collector. During the wintertime, 
quite a bit more vertical in terms around the south. But typically, in the past, they tended to say somewhere at an angle about what your latitude is. So where I live in Swisher, we're about 41, 42 degree latitude. That would be approximately correct. Uh, we'll show, show a little data here in a bit on that. The other is collector asthma. That's eventually taken from being pointed straight south. So if you have your collector facing, me at least it feels like that direction is south. I don't know how the rest of you feel over here. But somebody else is pointing that way. I don't know. Anyhow, if we want to point a straight south, that would essentially be a zero asthma. 90 degree angle to the east. 270 to the west, 180 to the north. And in most situations, we'd be looking at having it pointed straight south or southeast to southwest. But what happens if I just point it east? I get a lot less power. You get less power, but if not half the power that you have pointed to the south. So every little bit does end up a little bit more important. And just looking at this tilt angle, uh, I'm not saying this is the total amount of power, but relatively, if we had a solar cluster that we could track the sun on both axes, in other words, we could point it to the east in the morning, we could turn to the south at noon, go towards the west in the evening, and then it would also track on a, on a tilt angle throughout the day and by season of the year. We say that's 100% of kind of the solar energy that we can collect. If we just put it at a fixed angle, at, and this is for yeah, kind of east central Iowa, let's say, or that latitude, if we put it at about a 35 degree fixed angle, we could get about 70% of the solar energy. So you say, we're just going to buy all two axis traffic, right? Down so an extra thirty percent may cost you twice as much. Or I don't I don't have those number at my fingertips, but significantly more expensive, especially as you start going to larger arrays. But we just we said, yeah, maybe we'll make it so we can tip it, flatten it out in the summertime, tip it a little steeper in the winter, go from eighteen degree in the summer. 50, 60 degree tilt angle in the, in the winter, yeah, we gain about 4%. Of the I'm not sure I want to pay for extra tracking or things like that. What happens if I just put it on my roof? A 312 pitch roof, 14 degree angle? Well, yeah, we've lost a little bit. We're still at 68%. So I think that's why we see both ground mount and roof mount uh, fixed, uh, fixed angle. So, we could probably come up with 30 or 40 different reasons in here of why you might go solar. Uh, certainly, desire to have a renewable energy source. Uh, certainly, a big part of, we'll look at here in just a little bit, a big part of the interest in solar has been through tax incentives that help defray the cost up front and uh, really make these uh, potentially more. Or suitable, all the prices that we talk about. This is one for me that is, is tough to try and predict. But the future increases in electrical costs, certainly they have gone up, and we could look at kind of past history, but you know, your crystal ball is probably as good as mine. And related to that is not only maybe the upfront electrical costs, but other costs that start being added in transmission line charges, energy charges, kind of surcharges. When I looked at my electrical bill here this last week or so, I saw, okay, it's 11 cents for the first 500 kilowatt hours, and then it's 6 or 8 cents after that, and that doesn't count. Down below, there's energy charge, another 3 cents a kilowatt hour, transmission charge, another Three cents a kilowatt hour. I started adding them up. 14, 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And so 
I guess uh, trying to defray those or eliminate those future increases would be a reason for the might be this far. So let's start kind of getting into looking at uh, sizing and uh, kind of what the uh, finances of some of these things might be. How big a system you want to put in? How big a system do you need? Typically, what I've seen occurring, and what a lot of utilities can work with you on, is a sizing system that will about meet your previous year's electrical need. Uh, usually, it's sized for less than 100%. Because if we start overproducing and we're connected to the utility, we're putting that back on the grid, there's Variety of different ways that it's priced. It may be priced at essentially off of wholesale dollars instead of retail dollars. It may not even get priced, it may just accumulate. Well, that's not all. But typically, we're looking at sizing it for something less than meeting the total electrical needs for, for your house, the farm, whatever you're looking at. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about net metering and, and how some of the different utilities can handle it. We'll look at some electrical demands of some farm operations. This is a farm operation in North Central Iowa, and shown in blue is their electrical demand by month, and over here is the amount of electricity in kilowatt hours. This is 5,000 kilowatt hours, going all the way up to 30,000 kilowatt hours. Now, for my home, we're typically using here about four or five hundred kilowatt hours. So, fairly high electrical demand on this farm. And you see January, April, during the summer, very low. What happens here? Drying. Drying forward. You bet. We're running lots of fans, big fans. And we've got, you know, 30,000 kilowatt hours during the month of October. So big demand. How does that match up with what the solar is available in October? Not very well. But in some cases, the utility company has been willing to look at your electrical use over the whole year by the system and allow you to accumulate essentially credit for that excess electrical production occurring in here and allow you to pull that back off the grid. Now, the bigger the customer, maybe the more restrictions they may put on them because that's a huge demand factor that they have right there. But that starts playing into a very somewhat different rate than what uh, I may have just from a residential customer. A uh, different uh, farming operation, you say, well, this looks like they're getting a lot more solar production. Actually, it's still about the same amount. They're both roughly 50 kW solar installation. It's just that they didn't have a really high peak here. This is actually for a, uh, a swine building that's tunnel ventilated, which means they have large fans that they pull air through during the hottest part of the summer. And so you see here during July and August, the demand goes up. Uh, you might say, why do you have to keep here in January and then in April and then it drops off? Some of that may actually be by the size of hogs that are in the building at the time. Smaller hogs, they take more fan capacity, and the hogs are bigger, and the fans more. And so there's some, some peaks and valleys here, but not the really high peaks. And again, roughly about the same amount of solar generation that matched up somewhat better than that. In fact, some of these figures I actually have in a handout. I'm going to grab those quick and pass those back. I'm just going to start them on the front on both sides and pass them back. Yeah, just pass just pass the stats back and hopefully it makes it to the back. You know, that's one of the benefits of sitting in the front. 
you get the get the handouts right away. I always sit in the back row. I guess I'll take my chances on that. But it makes it back. So this matching of man with when the solar is available, we're looking at it here on a month by month basis. But as you think about your own farm, your own house, you know, right now, probably I mean, Literally, right now, two o'clock in the afternoon, sunny day, it's probably possible, very possible, likely, that you're going to be producing more electricity than what you're using. Sun goes down at night, you're going to need some of that electricity back, and that's where having, uh, having being connected to the grid works very well. So you might say, how much electricity am I going to get from a one PW? solar array or 10 kW solar array. And I have heard a few of the numbers, but you know, you know, how does the typical guy from the university answer? It depends, right? And it does depend on a lot of different factors, including your location, what angle will the collector be set at, will it be facing south, and probably one of the Better places to look for information on that is a website, and I'm not going to put the whole website up here, but if you just do any sort of web search for EV watts calculator, it's basically the first thing that comes up. It's a solar calculator where you can put in location, angle, azimuth, and it will make an estimate of what a and if they put it out in watts or in kilowatt hours, but either a one watt or most likely from a one PW system will get. And in fact, uh, we did have this at Iowa Energy Center, which was, was basically been uh, funded. But this would be the type of information that you would get that month by month, hour by hour, would show. Uh, what that output would be in terms of uh, watts. It would total it over here in terms of in a 24 hour period, how many watts, and then give you a total total month by kilowatt hours. And then you can add those up for the year. In this case, it's around 1500 kilowatt hours from a one PW solar array. And most of what I've seen for I'll just say the upper Midwest will range from probably 11 or 1200 kilowatt hours to maybe 1400 kilowatt hours for a 1 kW solar unit. So, again, somewhere in that ballpark, but you can get those estimates for your location and uh, I think it's, it's pretty accurate, pretty reliable. This actually says it's for. Or one PWAC in reference to kind of optimum optimum conditions. But I think the calculators out there will do a nice job of looking at actual weather conditions for you. In terms of okay, okay I have twelve hundred kilowatt hours of electricity. What's that worth? Well, as my dad who was in the machinery business always says, then you're buying it for yourself. Well, selling wholesale or buying retail. And actually, it depends on a whole lot more than that. Certainly, if you're replacing electricity that you would have otherwise used, you're sending it offsetting directly to retail costs. Uh, if you can bank that electricity and pull it back off to net metering, you still may be able to use that at essentially avoiding retail costs. But you know, I could ask probably most of you here what you're paying per kilowatt hour for electricity now. You might come up with something oh, 10, 12, 14 cents per kilowatt hour. Maybe the average price. I started looking at rate prices. There's usually a fixed basic charge, or sometimes it's called a meter charge. At least some of the companies I've looked at, ten to twenty dollars per month. That's the price of just having electricity to 
to your house, he would be gone the whole month, never using the water. Then there's usually electricity costs, or maybe an energy surcharge, or maybe a distribution surcharge. And if you get into large systems, there may even be a demand charge based on how big a peak you generate. Usually, I would say these are the ones that many of us would be looking at. Uh, as I looked at, basically, the utility that serves our house, it, it gets just a little more complicated in that uh, we have a meter charge that's around $10 to $12 a month. Uh, as I looked, there's an energy and transmission charge that I didn't go through all my bills to see how that varied, but as I had enough, it's close to six cents a kilowatt hour. In the winter time, first 500 kilowatts is 9.2 cents. Next 700 kilowatt hours, 6.7 cents. Over 1,200 kilowatt hours, two and a half cents. Good news, I don't know how to look at it. Good news is, the bad news is, we never get to buy electricity for two and a half cents. I guess the good news is, we never use quite that much electricity either. So, uh, but if you were using in the winter time, 2,000 kilowatt hours, maybe you had electrical heating and things like that. So you start defraying those costs with solar. Maybe that's only offsetting well, maybe add those two together. Maybe only eight cents per kilowatt hour of that. It's really saving you versus for, if we start getting down here, that could be up to 15 cents a Big difference in how that all comes together. Summertime, it's 11 cents plus energy and transmission. You know, residential customers often use more electricity throughout the summer months because of air conditioning and things like that. And the summer months are June 16th to September 5th, so basically three months. For some commercial customers, a little bit different rate scale, higher meter charge, a little higher, uh, at least no drop off. In, or not significant problem. And so you start looking, you go, hey, I'm not sure how much I'm going to save. Well, there is a way to get a handle on that that we'll talk about uh, here a little bit more towards the end. Ben mentioning kind of this net metering and using the, the grid to pay some of that electricity. Essentially, a net metering type of tariff would say that. We are banking that extra electricity with our utility company. So if I'm overproducing, I'm actually essentially spinning the meter backwards. It may not quite physically work that way in the meter, but that, that's how it's happening. And so I'm banking that way. And when I need extra electricity, I can pull it back off the grid. And that excess generation, whether it's hour by hour or day by day, gets added up. Sometimes some of the utilities will say we'll do that over the entire month. And the utilities as have said we'll do that not only annually but essentially perpetually. We'll never pay you for the electricity. If you start really cutting your electrical use and you're hardly using any electricity and that solar collector is still generating more, it just keeps getting banked and banked and banked. Just a lot. So like that. The other fine print that says if you sell your house with the solar collector, they may even buy it back from you at that all that bank electricity just goes to the next owner. It may even be bought back at the sale rate or it may just, just go to you. So that's an incentive not to overproduce, but to produce close to what we want to get. Not all utilities will do the net metering. Some will say if you, after a month's time, if you produce excess, we'll pay you for the excess at our avoided cost. Typically, I tend to think the avoided cost is at after the sale rates, which may be down. Uh, under five cents a kilowatt. 
So make some big, big differences. Other considerations, uh, you know, just zoning ordinances, we talk about meter charges, rates. Uh, you need an interconnection agreement with your utility. Uh, there needs to be inspection of the installation. You need permission from the utility to operate. It has to cause a disconnect. So if power does go out, you can get disconnected from the grid. And you probably do need insurance both for the installation itself. You may need some liability insurance. Uh, maybe a part of the regular liability policy, but you certainly uh, may require that. Uh, we talked some about uh, mentioned roof mounting versus ground mounting. And don't want to go into a lot of detail here, but just in looking at uh, some of those differences, uh, I tend to think of some of the positive of the roof mount and out of the way. It's been cheaper to install, it's out of the way from rocks being thrown by lawnmowers. Uh, kale, that may be, that's probably an issue no matter how you have. Uh, but it may not be as accessible if you decide you want to wash it off because of a lot of road dust. Uh, it may not be as easy to clean off in terms of snow in the winter time. Uh, there's still some issues there in terms of roof. Ground mount is a little more expensive, but maybe a bit more accessible if you do want to use some, some washing or cleaning or put snow off of it because the most of the, well, Many of the spring inverters that are being used, and we're maybe having some changes to that. But there is potential that if you have shading on one portion of a, an array, it pretty much cuts the power production, at least for that array that's being fed by that inverter. Because just think of it like, kind of like a spring Christmas tree lights for one bulb out. Full screen goes dark, same sort of thing can happen. So, certainly, shading is a big issue that we do want to avoid, uh, just orientation. Uh, one of the things that sometimes comes up, especially calling to a fire department, is what about fire hiding around this? Because it's not like you can just flip a switch and turn that panel off, at least, light is on it. It will be producing a DC current. And so there's you know, some things to think about there. You mentioned <coughs> dust and snow on panels and just thinking which way am I from the road? Do I have a rock road or you know, how much dust might be might be the accumulator? Um, one of the interesting things with solar panels is the colder they are actually the better they are. It's not huge differences. Um, but there's some decrease as our temperatures rise higher. Uh, and so with some of the work mount, maybe they get a little warmer than a, a ground mount room, but uh, usually those factors are taken into account as they're being rated. Some other things to consider, a uh, big part of it, I mentioned, is the uh, exemption in terms of Income tax, uh, but other things to think about also sales tax, property tax, insurance, maintenance, and financing costs. Sometimes these things aren't really thought about, and it very, does vary by location. At least what I could find is on sales tax that uh, in Iowa the equipment is exempt for on site solar use. In terms of property tax, what I found for Iowa was. 100% exemption for five years. After five years, it's a little bit specified, but my assumption would be that they might start charging property tax. And operation maintenance, probably not a lot of maintenance on these, but some suggestions I've seen would say maybe allocate 15 to 10 to 15 dollars per kilowatt per year in case there's a problem with one of the panels. Uh, I'm going to take you, well, yeah, I'm going to take you through 
a installation of a solar unit <coughs> with a farmer that I know, um, in fact, I know him fairly well, but back a couple of years ago, the utility company that he was getting electricity from had a rebate program for solar installations. He went to a solar meeting and found out about this and went, what the heck? Over and told his wife, I need a new shop. To put my solar array on. We need to get this, we need to get this solar array and have a place to put it. I need a new farm shop to put that on. Uh, I think what he's really saying is he needed a new farm shop for a long time. This might be a good opportunity to do that. The problem was the meeting he'd gone to was in, I think, October or November. Solar rebate was running out at the end of the year. But he was faced with one of the challenges was getting that shop put up within the last 60 days of the year, probably a little bit less. So this starting construction there, the poles put in the ground, and uh, they did get the shop up, the roof lined up, and to the point where he could apply for solar rebate for them. This is a shop without the solar panels on, at least closed in, and as you can kind of imagine just looking at it, how brightly the sun's shining on this side, this is the south facing side of the shop, and that's where the panels are going to go. So this is then the, the solar installation with all the panels on the roof. Uh, I think you did tell me after they calculated through kind of the size of solar installation needed, he ended up with a little bigger shop. Get, get enough for a pair of So, uh, to, to match up. Uh, he does have some grain drying, but he does. His house is also set up primarily with uh, a heat pump, and so electrical heat, primarily electrical use there. And one of the things that I did quiz him a little bit about, I said, okay, got this utility pool right here, well, that does put a little bit of a shadow on there may not be a big thing, it may not be that often or that much, but uh, he did actually put up a green bin to the south and was quizzing me fairly hard. How far away does that green bin have to be so that he doesn't get any shady things around the way? These are the inverters inside, essentially three inverters, roughly uh, about seven kilowatts per inverter, and the dark guard dog there along as well. And this was kind of the part of why he said it was a no brainer for him to put it up. It was a 21 kilowatt solar installation. The total cost for installation, inverters, all that, was $61,000, so about $3,000 per KW, pretty close there. And at that point, Ryan Energy, that he was on, or is on, and the rebate for 50% of the installation costs. So he's looking at 30000 of it to pay the front. Now, that was taxable income because that was being paid to him, even though he had to spend it on something, that was taxable income. But there was also a 30% federal tax credit, and this was several years ago when farming had some fairly high returns looking for ways to reduce his taxes, he could certainly make use of that. And that can be taken over several years. That federal tax credit is still in effect. You still get that 30% federal tax credit for his farm or residential. At that time, there was a 18% state of Iowa tax credit. Same sort of thing that it's not a deduction, it's a credit that comes off of your taxes. Currently, from what I understand in Iowa, it's a 15% tax credit, and uh, that's something to be referred to. And his tax accountant said he could depreciate the remaining portion that he did not get a rebate on. He could depreciate that on his taxes as well. I started adding those up, and I go, Tom, I just bought your solar collector. I'm a Lion customer. 
federal taxpayer, looking like you're getting good care of this, paid for by me. Not for the loan, but I give him a hard time to try to get him to buy the loan. So, in this case, it kind of goes, yeah, you know, I get that price of that solar rate down to uh, really almost very little cost, at least directly up front. In looking at the data that you collected from that, this is the kind of the level of the solar production throughout the you know, year 2015, or basically late 2014 to end of 2015. And uh, at least at one point there, we saw some numbers around 200 kilowatt hours per month for KW times about 20 KW panel. Now, there, there's the middle of the summer. Up there around 4,000 kilowatt hours per month of production. In December, kind of the lowest sun time, down around 50, kilo, 50 kilowatt hours per month, or times uh, 20, around 1,000 kilowatt hours. When you look at his electrical demand, actually the winter time is fairly high demand for it because of heating for the home. Off, off, a little bit during the summer, and then we got into the fall. Actually, it was a fairly dry fall, so he didn't have as much grain dry as he This last year, he's been a crying crocodile here. He says, What we did, grain yield, we had to do more drying, and I'm already out of banking of solar energy. During the winter, he was certainly behind, but once we got to about here in March, Electrical use drop, production went up, and he started making electricity, and then we all great grind back this last year. He said, by then November, I'd run out of credit. And so, you, but he's still able to uh, really create a lot of his electrical use. Prior to having the solar installation, his total for the year was around 35,000 kilowatt hours. Averaging 3,000 kilowatt hours a month, some months down around 1,000, some months 6,000. Do that all off the grid, the total electric bill, just over $3,500. So kind of averaged out at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, but that's throwing everything in there with, you know, the different rates and meter charge, etc. During 2015, estimated total electric use actually is very similar. He probably put nearly, he did put over 20,000 kilowatt hours onto the grid. You can see that that went back out. What he couldn't really see for sure was how much electricity did never made it to the beat. It just came from the collector and he was using it exactly as it was being used. Best estimates, best information we had was around, around 9,000 kilowatt hours. So total electric system production, just uh, just over 29,000 kilowatt hours total use, and he actually drew 26,000 kW back to the grid, but of that, 20,000 was offset, and so it is that he built for the year just under $800. So, he paid him $2,800 for that year, and when he had gotten Greg Brendan to all of us to help pay for that turned out to be a pretty good deal for him. Now I'm saying, oh, at uh, 50% rebate, that's no longer available. How do I decide if I can afford and what sort of payback I would get for this? I'll tell you what, the more I dug into it, the more it was comfortable to have, absolutely says, Yes, in your situation it will, and in your situation it will. It gets complicated. All the things of not only electric production, but the rate schedule that you're buying it from the utility from, those sorts of things. Probably one of the best things I found for that is the system analysis model that's from the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, and it's actually software that we download, 
and takes a little effort to kind of work your way through. But you just do a web search for SAM Solar Collector. It'll take you right to the website. It'll ask if you want to download this software. And you say yeah, and then it takes a while. And you install it on your computer. But it has area that you can put in system design, system cost, put in what your particular rebates might be. You can put in your own financial information. You can even go in and look up by state, by utility, what the utility rate schedule that you're in. And it will pull that into the model. Um, After you pull all that information in, then you can do a simulation, simulation, and then it will tell you how many years to pay back, what your cash flow is. It's really a very dynamic model. That you can start adjusting, and well, what if I change chill angle on the collector? What if I make these changes? And it, you can rerun it kind of as many times as you want. You say, well, what if I think electricity is going to go up 1% a year? How does that change the projection? What if I think it's going to go up 2% a year? What if I don't think it's going to go up at all? What if I want to put in property tax on it? You can, you can make all those adjustments within the model, and I will say it does make significant differences. It can go anywhere from that. 15 to 20 year payback down to maybe a 7 year payback, depending on those factors that are unique to your situation. Other things that are available and are the Solar EV Energy Guide. It's got a 30 page publication. That's why I did reproduce it and bring it along today. If you want it, right there it is in the list. The PV Watts calculator that I mentioned uh, is also available. In fact, the PV Watts calculator is essentially pulled into the SAMS calculator based on your location. There's a lot of good information as well from out at uh, the Ohio State University on on farm solar energy. There's publications there that you can go in and look at financing, look at uh, costs of installations. There's a series of about six of those that uh, the other thing that you may be wondering, well, you mentioned these solar rebates and uh, tax credits. Uh, what's available for Iowa? Or what's available for Illinois? What's available for Wisconsin? And it can change by community. There's a better website. I say it, Desire Solar, only without the E. And Call exactly what those letters stand for. But you just Google that. It is, you can put in your zip code and it will give you a list of energy related assistance that is available. Some of it is solar, some of it is not. So you can find things on geothermal and wind, and, and, but you can narrow it down to solar and but you've got to then go through and say, does this really apply to my situation? Uh, if you do want to get a hold of some of these bulletins that I've downloaded, you certainly can email me at greatd at iostate.edu, and I'd be glad to just email those bulletins back to you. And I think with that, I would say this is maybe a sunrise right here. Now, I know the location of this was a sunset, but it may just be the sunrise of solar. I think we still do have a few minutes, is that right? Yeah. Question was essentially how much weight would that those solar units add to the roof and on on the construction of the roof? Uh, actually, the amount of load that those solar units add to the roof is fairly minor, and, and most roofs are de designed with uh, probably 25 pounds per square foot snow load. Certainly, that is something to look at. Is what was the original load that that roof was designed for? And how does that match up with 
the snow load that you might expect and the added weight. In a lot of cases that I've seen, probably not a big difference in strength of the roof that is The question is, what about insuring it? And yes, uh, that's something that you would want to have insured. Uh, most things I've seen said it's a fairly small rider on that, but that would be like insuring. The question was, what size of hail? It's somewhat relative to the angle, um, and they are, I would say, fairly hail resistant, but they are not hail proof, and they can be broken by hail stones. First, I would tend to think, at least just things I've seen, things I've heard, fairly similar to windshields and cars, and so, you know, probably in the neighborhood of a uh, a two inch hailstone or something like that would be required to damage. So, can they be broken by hail? Yes. Uh, I, but I have not heard that be a major issue with them. Question on a tariff on imported, essentially solar cells. And while it sounded like a fairly significant tariff on that, as a full part of the solar installation, I want to say it's like a 15 cents per watt of sort of tariff in the world. The module is only a 30 or 35 cent module. Holy cow, that's an extra 50 percent. But the module price itself, just the cell, is a relatively small portion of the whole solar installation. And so maybe it added, I would say, maybe 3 to 5 percent to the cost of the solar installation. So I would say probably not a not a significant deterrent compared to the price of the So it goes to the back. How long do these last? Like 20 years, 15 years? Yeah. The uh, question was how long do the solar systems last? Typical numbers I've seen would say expect a 25 year life. I think they will last beyond that. There is some degradation that does occur throughout the life of the uh, panels. And so, 20 years from now, they're not going to be making as much electricity. Uh, that SAMS model, you can put numbers in for that, or there are numbers built in for that to look at degradation. But probably uh, 25 years long. So I can pour it back over here. Uh, question on batteries for storage uh, and implications of cost. I don't feel completely familiar with that. Uh, I think there have been improvements in battery storage, but typically what I've seen is if there's any access to the grid at all, that you're probably better off looking at using the grid for storage. Where I tend to think of battery storage is at a remote location where you only have access to the grid, and, and we have seen some, some use of that. Uh, but then you're really probably also looking, really trying to reduce your electrical usage, your electrical demand, you know, maybe for lighting and, and uh, some things like that, but not air conditioning and those sorts of things. This one right here. Is um, I was going to ask about batteries, but just a comment that um, my experience with uh, my solar panels that we installed about six years ago, there really there's no maintenance. And it's just, uh, they're up there, they're working, you don't have to do a thing. Whereas if you have a wind, you've got moving parts and maintenance that uh, is ongoing and the problem with the big wind storm. Right. The kind of the comment was with solar installation about six years old, about the only maintenance you've had is checking your utility. Right. Where with a wind turbine, and I know some guys that have wind turbines that they're some ongoing maintenance of gearboxes and, and things like that. And the wind turbine is not in a spot that's easy to get to. It's up in the air that you have to send somebody out and bring it down, things like that. And I think some of those issues also have been a challenge for what I call the small scale wind production, where the solar, the small scale, pretty scalable. There is some problem with the Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the question was, if you're connected to the grid with a solar unit, can you be using some of that solar if the power is powered without? My understanding is you are without power as well. There may be some some production, but I see a couple hands quickly go up and say, no, if you're wrong on that. As long as you're generating enough uh, solar power to equal your demand, you'll still have it. Just, you'll have ground out if, if it drops below the third level. That's, you need battery backup for the power out in the night. So you can it. And, and you would, you, if there is power outage, then you have to disconnect from the grid. Oh, it's automatic. It, it's automatic. It's automatic. But, okay, but, but I'm saying it has to be set up to disconnect from the grid. If you have battery stations, you will have power. I'm sorry? If you have battery backup, you will have power. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the comment was if you have battery backup, you will support that. I think we've reached right the end of our time, maybe even just a little bit after. Thank you all for coming. And